Good. Um, all right, I'd like to start uh, with this table that's on your handout and then um, get into what I do uh, with forecasting. But um, this table, this is a very useful table. Uh, one of the first things I did when I, I got hired into Solomon Brothers in 1986 into the market an analysis department and uh, uh, you know, I worked in market analysis, equity research for a while, uh, pr proprietary trading. I ended up with the last uh, several years I was there. W there were we were uh, tr prop trading, directional trading, international markets on the equity side, and uh, so that's what I did. In the process of being there, um, and previously, I developed a, for a unique form of forecasting. It's a form of time series analysis. It's um, it's different than what I learned at the Berkeley Business School. I spent a lot of time there in the stat department. Berkeley Business School, Janet Yellen's home base. <laughs> doing that. Um, anyways, um, you know, I, I cut my teeth on Box Jenkins, ARIMA models, and Fourier, and things like that, multi-regression models. And in the process of my career, I found that they were not very useful for forecasting. They, um, I, they were, gave you a slight advantage, sort of like a crooked coin to us. But um, I developed something that's uh, based on rates of change. And I discovered basically a non-random component of rates of change. And I came up with a complex algorithm. Unfortunately, I can't demonstrate it here because it's going to be on YouTube today. But I, what I do when I go around in, uh, I don't want the Chinese to re-engineer, re you know, reverse engineer what I'm doing. So I, all you're going to get is my conclusions and of, of, what, uh, of what I do. And uh, that's, there's a little uh, explanation of it there. Basically, the model is looking for inflection points. Most of the time, it's looking to buy things that are down, you know, buy low and sell high. So uh, I'm going to present you with some, what I think are some opportunities in the buy, ho buy low, sell high department. But let's start with this table. So this table is not really the model, but it's the business cycle overlaid with the Dow Jones. And a um, lot of data here. Let's not get lost in the numbers at the top. Can you see where the cursor is? Is it showing up? Um, uh, yes. You, okay. OK, so let's, let's look at the bottom line because um, we don't have all the time um, in the world. The average recession from 1902 to the present is 15 months. The average expansion is 45 months. Pre-1990, the average expansion was 37 months. So an expansion only lasts three or four years on average, three years before Greenspan. Greenspan kind of will lengthen things, you know, what the Federal Reserve does is try to eliminate the business, smooth out the, the oscillations in the business cycle. Um, this cycle is now 54 months old, which is more than the average. It's not as long as the last three. So the last three were, uh, the previous one was 73 months long, the expansion, 120 months and 92 months before that. And uh, the Fed believes very strongly that they can control what they call the cyclical component of the economy, which is the recession. They, don't, they think that they can ban recessions. That's the Fed's uh, viewpoint. They, they believe that with absolute certainty, that there will, no be, there will not be any more recessions, that they control it. Their stochastic model. You know, if you talk to Fed officials, this is what they say. Well, they certainly lengthened it. Um, but uh, just a side note on that, I think what they've done is just increase layers of debt. You know, basically they've just lev kept leverage up the system, leveraging it up, leveraging it up. And so now we have a very leveraged up system. But let's not spend a lot of time on that. The point of this table is the Dow Jones has declined in every recession. That's the next to last column here where the cursor is. These are the percentage declines that have ranged from 6% to 89%, 89% of course in the 29-33 period, 6% following World War II. And um, the pattern is, if you focus on this last line, the bottom down here, it peaks two and a half months before the recession starts. It's a good thing to know, of course you don't know and when the recession starts, they don't tell you until much later, right? So the National Bureau of Economic Research does the cycle dates. but. Um, so th basically, the stock market is a leading economic indicator. It starts going down for no reason while the news is still good. And then it bottoms. The average, by the way, so every, the Dow Jones has declined, if you measure it this way that I do, in every recession, no exceptions. The average decline is about 31%. And it bottoms uh, four months before the next expansion starts. So um, that's the idea. You, you, the, the point of this table is, if you're a portfolio manager, um, 
you basically want to be long from when you want to be a buyer when it looks like the end of the world at the at the depths of a recession and nobody will ever get the get it to the right day or anything but um, you know that's when stocks are cheap and they go down stocks go down because earnings go down now here's um, here are the earnings declines in S&P 500 earnings, four quarter trailing sum and reported earnings over the last three recessions. In the 1991 recession, earnings declined 37%. This is on the back of that page. 54% uh, in the 2002 recession and 92% because of uh, a lot of write-offs in 2009. Um, but so earnings go down recession stocks go down so if you think there's a recession and the likelihood going back to that table is one happens you know every four or five years after the you know, expansion lasts for four or five years and then there's a recession so it's sort of like clockwork clockwork um, my forecast is is that we're going to have a decline in earnings and that uh, a good fit for where earnings go is a hundred month average um, I have a monthlyized number, so anyways, that that's down about fifty. You know, you could er, earnings could could uh, it's an, an interpolated number. Of course, earnings are not um, monthly, but anyways, uh, about you know half. So earnings look like we're we're up, we're probably my economic forecast is we're probably turning down. It's about time for it. A lot of the economic series that I forecast, such as auto sales, consumer sentiment industrial production, things like that, which we don't really have time to get into, unfortunately, um, should be turning down soon. They're not turning down yet, but we're, we're probably on the verge of it. And uh, then looking at the index, of course, the index has declined 50% in the last two recessions, pretty much in, in, in touch with earnings. So S&P from the 2000 peak to the, to the 2002 October bottom, down 49%, to October 2007 peak, to the March 2009 low, minus 57 percent, and I'm looking for, I don't know about, I don't know how much down 50 percent, but uh, that's the 200 month average is down 33 percent in the index. Anyway, so some kind of downside risk. That's the overall view. Um, I, that comes out of the model forecast. I'm not just picking that out of the air. Um, again, unfortunately, I can't demonstrate it. I, I encourage you to take my card or bring your card up if, you, if uh, next time I come through Zurich, I can show you with a lap what I do do is do the presentation to clients and prospective clients um, from the laptop but for obvious reasons I can't do that here um, now here's how that looks uh, with the recession bands overlaid with the S&P this is not in on your chart this is just on my screen so um, now this is the 2000 advance um, this is uh, they they have the National Bureau of Economic Research has the recession starting in, in April 2001 and declining and ending in November 2001 so it looks like the S&P bottomed after the recession which kind of contradicts what I just told you right that it's supposed to uh, however S&P earnings kept going down the 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 low in S&P earnings was in um, the fourth quarter of 2002 which is down here and the market actually bottomed in October. So if you go by earnings, I would argue with this date, date that they have here that we didn't have a recovery following that November 2001 date. Things were so. Anyways, that's a con looks like a contradiction, but um, it's uh, so. This l let's focus on the last one here. The um, last recession market peaked in October 2007. They have the recession ban starting in December. Declined, you know, 50 percent. They have the uh, bottomed in, in March. They have the expansion starting, ending in June, starting in July. So now we're 54 months along. So that's, that's the basic idea. Uh, and I, you know, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this because we don't have a lot of time. But that, if there's one thing I can leave with you, it's that investing over the business cycle. They, don't, they didn't teach me anything about this in business school, finance, textbooks, anything. I think it's one of the most fundamental things you know, about uh, being a portfolio manager and running investments is understanding the business cycle and and uh, being long and short at the right times or being long and out and, and, uh, you know adapting your asset allocation to economic conditions it's a simple story okay so end of that let's go to my 
So here's, let me speak for a second about what the model does. So I have a form of time series analysis similar to Box Jenkins modeling auto regressive integrated moving average, different concept. I'm using rates of change, but I, I give the, the forecast for Box Jenkins, if you've ever used an ARIMA model, it looks basically like this. They have these bands that go like a megaphone, so you're 100% sure it's either going to go up or down, which is not very useful, right? So mine is, is pretty black and white. So it's, it gives you direction, up or down, or uncertain. So, but it, it, it's black or white, it's going to go up or go down. It gives you position, beginning, middle, end, and it gives you confidence level. Is this a strong or weak signal? And it's a 12 period forecast. So, with monthly data, that, which I call long term, one year, weekly data, one quarter, 12 weeks, three months, one quarter. So, the model likes to buy low and sell high. It's looking for inflection points. And uh, we'll, I'll be flipping over some of those real quickly in a second here. At the, at the low sentiment, buy low sentiment points, everybody hates it. You know what I mean? Um, the news is bad. British Petroleum at the, you know, after the oil spill. Um, solar stocks 18 months ago. Things like that. Nobody wants to touch them with a 10-foot pole. So um, I like that. I like bad sentiment for buying opportunities. I, it has to fit with the model forecast, of course. But uh, sell high, everybody loves them. H high sentiment. Everybody's invested, or, you know, they're already situated, portfolio managers are already committed. And so a lot of what happens is the, the portfolio flows, if you think of people on one side of a boat, they run to the other side of the boat. And I've seen this over and over. So wherever people are positioned at inflection points, then it's them kind of reallocating and going in the other direction that makes these things happen. And I really think there are some real opportunities now, just besides for market direction within sectors, I'll show you. Um, I think there's some really excellent opportunities in sector allocation at the moment. In this, and of course, the ones that I like, everybody hates, and the ones that I hate, everybody likes. So uh, the model's best at emerging markets. Over time, it's been uh, caught the cycles really well in emerging markets. Uh, major market inflection points like 2000 top, 2002 bottom, 2007 top, 2009 bottom. I'm not a perma bearer. I like model, you know, at, at major inflection points, it's been very uh, positive. I, I, we have that in our intro file. I can show you the reports I wrote. Anyways, uh, sectors, really, really good. So that's what people, people really rely, even if they disagree with my market view. Uh, a lot of people, uh, professional money managers, look at my sector. And in the report that I do, there's a breakout of sectors, industry groups, and individual stocks in the US, Europe, and Japan. And not individual stocks in Japan, just sectors groups and then economic data. So that's what the model is good at. It, I do everything uh, foreign exchange commodities. It's not as uh, it's not quite as good at the other things. That's what it's best at. Okay, so what's the story? Um, my major call this year has been emerging markets. Short emerging markets. And here's how that's worked out. It's actually kind of strange. Uh, this is from this week's report. I think it's on the last page of your thing, but you, you can just look on the screen. The, the emerging market index relative to the S&P is, is underperformed by 33%. That comes from the index being down uh, 6% and the S&P up 26%. Now, beneath that index only being down 6%, um, a lot of countries ha have really cracked enormously. Peru is down 35% year to date in dollars. Uh, Indonesia down 21, Brazil 13 and 11. There are other ones that are down 20, 30 percent. That, that isn't all of them. That's just s some primary ones. Um, okay, so let's look at that. Uh, Indonesia. So this is Indonesia going back. The left side of this, this doesn't have a uh, time scale on the bottom. These are months, and this is 1990. Left, left end is 1990, beginning January. So this is the 2000, 1997, I'm sorry, 1997 Asia crisis. Remember that one? That's the Asian markets collapse. This is 2008, and this is now. Um, now, I'm presenting you the markets in, in my highest confidence level. This one is a, is a favorite short of mine, and it has been for a while. So it's down 30-something percent from the peak. It's down 20-something percent on the year. Uh, peaked in mid-year, spring, April, May, I believe. Um, so 
Let's notice one thing here. Uh, the 200-month average, I'm going to be flipping across a lot of charts here in a minute. Um, the 200-month average, the model doesn't give you a level. It's not like a regression model where it predicts a, a level for something based on other variables. It's, not, it's a different technique completely. Um, go away. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, just what I need in the middle of this presentation. Um, so my forecast is direction down, intensity strong, position about one third of the way, and you tend to get the, the point about these 200 period averages. You tend to get there. This is where it got there. It's basically equilibrium level that things return to. And as we flip, start flipping over markets, you'll see that that example over and over in weekly and monthly data. There's nothing magical about it. It's just markets are, in my theory of the universe, markets are a process that goes out of equilibrium. You can think of that as a bull market and when they're going up and back was a correction. So that would be mean reversion or something. And the model tries ca catches both of those pretty accurately, you know, away from mean and then back to mean. So anyways, we're going back down here in this direction, and that level is down 43%. So Indonesia, down. Very quickly, a couple others. Here's uh, Thailand. Uh, Thailand, that's the... Uh, 2000, it's 1997, Asia crisis. This is now, hasn't broken as much as Indonesia. 200, I have an early forecast down, no bottom in sight. It's down 50%. So I'm calling Thailand down 50%. <laughs> and uh, Philippines, Philippines, uh, looks like Thailand, uh, just breaking 200 month averages down here. I have direction down, intensity strong position early. Uh, minus 49%. And just a couple quick other ones. Merc uh, Mexico. It hasn't really broken yet. You notice that these all topped out months ago. Uh, this is the strange thing. that the, 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 the major markets are at new highs and emerging markets are rolling over. And uh, So the 200-month average is down 47%. And in Turkey, these are the strongest ones. They're all, uh, all over the map. They're not just Asia, but they're basically Asia Tiger, Latin America, and here's one that in the middle of Asia and and Europe, uh, Turkey. Not as much downside in Turkey. Okay, so let's talk about emerging markets for a second. Um, the, when the good times roll, the uh, money goes, it's time, think about the investment philosophy of the last three or four years, the last cycle. The emerging market boom. Remember that one? China, we're going to ex export materials to China for the Chinese and the growth in the middle class. And it's all one ball of wax. We're going to invest in, in cyclical stocks in the West that export to the new emerging middle class and in, in China. So that was the story. That was the investment thesis. It's all going wrong. So in the, on the way up, the money goes into emerging markets, the capital inflows from investments. The, their currency strengthens. Their interest rates go down. The central bank absorbs the current. They don't like the capital inflows, so they buy the dollars and euros. That means they're putting out their domestic currency, so their, their money supply is expanding. And um, it's, it's very stimulative, right? And uh, it, when it goes into reverse, uh, I don't know if any of you are from the US. This is a product called Roach Motel. Everybody ever heard of that? It's, it's, it's for cockroaches, you know, cockroaches. It's like a little mouse trap. It's a box where the, with a flap they can, you can't get out once they go in. And the, the sales pitch is uh, Roach Motel, you can check in, but you can't check out. <laughs> so that's sort of how emerging markets are. That's the this joke where you can get in, but the liquidity sort of disappears when, it, when, it times, when, it, when they go into liquidation, deleveraging cycle. So we're in a deleveraging cycle in emerging markets. What happens? The, the money goes out. The currency weakens, the interest rates go up, the central bank defends the currency by raising interest rates. We're seeing that in India and Brazil. And, um, and it's not fun. The inflation rate goes up and the economy goes down and, and you don't get out of it till the deleveraging cycle is over. And so I, I, I would argue that the, that is the transmission mechanism back into major markets on the, on the part of the whole, remember the whole investment thesis about investing in emerging markets. So what was it? Industrial companies, German exporters, you know, the gas turbines, the locomotives, any, you name it, machinery, equipment, caterpillar tractors, all that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, so the marginal, I think this is going to impact the exporters. And, of course, even consumer product companies, Unilever has been saying things like that. So I don't think this is a theme that's going to disappear. I think it's going to 
be the theme going forward for the, like the next year or so at least. So I think that's something to put into your, uh, on your radar screen of a decline, continued decline in emerging markets impacting um, Western multinationals that uh, have businesses in, you know, that have used, that expanded into emerging markets. So where does that leave? Let's go to... Uh, very quickly on the sector. So I have a, uh, not sectors, major markets. This is a synthetic composite index of global stock indexes monthly. And isn't it interesting how this, in this imaginary thing that I developed, is just an equally weighted average of the S&P, Hang Seng, DAX, a bunch of European indexes. And it's a synthetic, just a good way of saying what is world equity index is doing. It's got a heavy European weight. That's why it's not at a new high. It's got uh, Italy and Spain in it, some depressed markets. But anyways, the 200-month average has worked pretty well. It got, gets down there. Um, I'm showing this thing running out of steam pretty soon. Should begin to roll over. Not this after, maybe not this afternoon or this tomorrow or, you know, next week. But it, it, you know, in the in the important investment time frame for for portfolio managers, this is w this is supposed to be an inflection point on the order of 2007 or 2000, and we're supposed to have significant downside risk. Um, okay, enough said about that. I'm not here to say you know sell everything and head for the hills. Um, what I would like to point out are the opportunities. Can I ask a question? How do you arrive at your confidence? Uh, when you, when you yeah, it's a strong or weak signal. Unfortunately, I can't demonstrate it here because I don't want it to be on YouTube. So um, it's would a you. you <laughs> <laughs> no, I'd rather not. Uh, just so it's it's very clear. Basically, what I'm pr the model gives you a probability distribution. And it's the strength of the probability distribution. So it's basically I, I am predicting the model is a, it predicts a probability distribution of something going up or down 12 periods ahead. And it's the confidence level you can see in the, in the way that I've developed it of the probability di distribution if it's a strong or weak signal. I'm sorry I can't give a better answer than that. So. But um, anyways, let's, let's look at where the opportunities lie. Okay, now here's something I love to buy. This is um, something that's despised. It's a sector divided by the index. So this is relative, uh, this is stocks, Eurozone 600. Anybody get, take a guess at what we're looking at? Or what index, what sector relative to the index? Uh, utilities. No. This is utilities divided by Euro stocks monthly. It, the ratio has gone from 1.8 to the current uh, 0.8. So it's down more than 50%. And um, I have direction up, intensity strong, position just starting. So 12 month view, utilities are supposed to outperform. And nobody likes them. I know there's a lot of bad news, but remember that's bad news, buy low. That's what the bad news is always bad, buy low. So I'm not saying this is off to the races and you get huge absolute gains. I'm just, this is relative, right? They're supposed to outperform the index. So um, I also do have a, I think they could go up, but um, let, let's just think about where there's 200 week averages. Um, notice the, two, I mean 200 month, I'm sorry. Me notice the 200 month has come into play here, gets there, takes off, comes back, bounces, we're down below. So I think we're headed for an intersection somewhere up here somewhere, which is, um, up significantly. Um, I think there's a 30-40% upside out potential in this uh, sector. Now here's another one, uh, telecom. Here's telecom divided by Euro stocks. It doesn't look as depressed, but it is simply because this one, this was the TMT peak when telecom was, was, uh, it was very popular. Um, in, in that rally phase, telecom outperformed. In the recent rally phase, it's underperformed massively for obvious reasons. You know, the revenues are falling and you have to invest in every new network and it's a huge invest. You know, for, I don't need to tell you about all the problems for, in, with telecom companies. But um, remember, news, buy low, news is bad. So um, the t it turns out the 200 month average is on this ratio is up 64%. So um, and I think we are headed up in this direction. So those are the two 12-month 
uh, t so long term, um, which I call long term, one year forecast by utilities and telecom if you're a hedge fund and short the index against it. Um, it's also, of course, if you're a long only portfolio manager, it's also um, an overweight position. So instead of be over, being overweight, something else, you know, whatever, uh, luxury goods companies or, or uh, um, so 12 month view, that's my best outperform ideas. And it really, I think it's an arbitrage opportunity really. And here's the other side of the arbitrage. Industrial goods and services relative to the index. It's the mirror image, right? And think about what my scenario is, emerging markets and exporting and all these co companies. Um, it, so this is what people, and back to here, sell high, popular, optimistic sentiment. So what are, where are people situated? I think they're situated overweight, this stuff. The, and it's a stale theme left over from the previous boom. So um, one thing, so this is supposed, this is direction down, intensity, medium strong position just starting. And uh, since we don't have an all day, unfortunately, I, I, I do drill down onto I individual names. And in the report, I do um, names relative to the index. And I'm coming up with names like Valorec. Like a lot of these companies, they're, they are already going down, even though this hasn't looked like it's broken yet. So that's one thing I am seeing in the market at the moment, where individual stocks are acting a lot um, weaker than the indexes and the groups themselves, which is basically a sign of distribution. So you may have noticed that if you're running a long portfolio, you, uh, you, you notice the, in, the DAX just hit a new recent higher, the S&P or something, but wait, wait a minute, my stock is not at, you know, my stocks are not doing that. They're not at, there's only a hundred, a couple hundred stocks hitting new highs with the indexes in the U.S. So anyways, you put those two together. Here's the old Solomon Brothers synthetic position. Tele, here's telecom divided by industrial goods and services. So this has gone from 1.5 to to below 0.5 currently, and it's right at the lows. So here you could be market neutral for a hedge fund, if anybody's hedge funds in here, totally don't care what the market does. All you care is about is the difference between um, the telecom sector and the industrial sector. And I think uh, one thing about sector spread trades, if you've never done them, um, they're really low volatility. Uh, they're not like the market, or they're not like the, you don't have the volatility of an individual stock where it's going up and down five, ten percent a day. Sometimes these are really like sleep, you know, really slow, really low volatility. It's ca kind of capital intensive because if you have to short something, you you're prime, you have to work that out with your prime broker. The kind of so if you have like say a hundred million dollars and you want a hundred million dollars of exposure, you're gonna have to be leveraged because you're gonna have to have a hundred million long and a hundred million short. So depending on your prime broker the kind of leverage they will give you. They might, some prime brokers might consider that just a hundred million position because it's market neutral. Others would, would charge you, you know. So that's a, that's a whole other complex issue. Anyways, but if you're, I imagine most people, that's not their primary, they're not, you know, we're not gunslingers, probably most of us in this room. But uh, in a, from a more uh, portfolio management perspective, this is the difference of performance you could have by overweighting and underweighting something. Like you have a potential, the the 200 week average on this position is up 150 percent. So where this might not be the whole portfolio the position that you have, if you, at the margin, I would um, I would encourage you to lighten up on industrial stocks, industrial sector ETF, and ease into utilities and telecom 12 month view. Okay. Next, let's move to the. Um, Intermediate term forecast. Now I have uh, 12. So remember, monthly data, one year. That's what we've been looking at. 12 period forward forecast, and then weekly data, 12 weeks, three months, one quarter, next quarter. So it looks a little bit different in that time frame. The uh, the utilities and telecom are still there, but they're not the, the highest priority ones. Here are the highest priority ones: food and beverage, relative to stocks. Model fresh signal upward direction up intensity strong position just starting. Notice we're right at the 200 week average. 
And if you think about, now w here we're looking at back to 2003 is the beginning of this chart. So that's 2003 over here. Um, food, the, the two uh, classic defensive um, sectors in this cycle have been not utilities and telecom yet, they've underperformed. Um, they've been food and beverage and healthcare. So food, so people kind of flocked into these for a while, and while well, the market was at, European markets were acting sloppy, and then they f flocked out while the Euro while the indexes have been stronger. These have underperformed by a lot. The ratio has gone from 1.8 to 0.4, so down 0.4, you know, 4 on 18. So you know, it's about a 20 percent, almost a 20 percent move, 20 percent underperformance in food and beverage. But anyways, so fresh signal for me last few weeks uh, outperform. Uh, food and beverage should be heading back up. Uh, we are in the kind of equilibrium zone where it's it's also uh, it's had the correction. You know, it's the kind of thing where you, where it was like down here. Okay. The other one is healthcare. Similar picture. Healthcare has been outperforming for about six weeks now, um, above the 200-week average. Again outperformed while the market was sloppy over here, underperformed recently by a lot. The ratio has gone from 2.5 to 2, so down 5 on 25 is 20 percent. The ratio, so underperformed by 20 percent. Um, and uh, it's supposed to go back up, direction up, intensity strong, three-month view, food and beverage and healthcare. And um, when we look at, at my report, let's show, ooh. <laughs> uh, so here's the report. I have, uh, if, if you guys, if anybody who wants to get a sample of this, you can leave a business card. I, I, we, we could put you on the list for a while or something, if it something, sounds like something you're interested in. Um, I, have a, I, have a, I have the outperform and underperform ideas in the U.S. Here's outperform stocks, the group, and the stocks, the stocks relative to the group, and here are the underperform. And since we were just looking at Europe, let's look at the Europe page. Here's the European page. So remember I said healthcare. So here's the top picks outperform healthcare, food and beverage, real estate, utilities, and telecom. Didn't mention real estate, but that has an intermediate term forecast. And the underperform ideas are banks, industrials, construction and materials, luxury, financial services, technology, retail, travel, and leisure. I had ACOR. I guess ACOR just missed or something. Didn't they? Uh, that they had some disappointment yesterday or something I saw overnight then they some the ACCOR French company hotels they had some 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 news I saw anyways that was on my sell list um, so uh, this is what I do with this report I'll just spend a second on it so um, my you know sophisticated institutional investors take a look at this and they print out this page and they're looking for long and short ideas and they I, they print out this page, and I encourage them to take a red pen and circle this for long ideas and circle this for short ideas. So maybe we can just take a quick look at a couple of those. So um, Santa Fe Aventus relative to healthcare equally weighted average. So here's, remember the healthcare looks positive relative to the index stocks. Here's Santa Fe relative to the group. And equally weighted group, and it's a buy low situation. Looks like that, absolute, looks like that. So it's, it's up, it's not, you know, unfortunately this is how this market is so picked over that to, to, try, to try to find us something that isn't up a lot, this is kind of the best I can come up with. It's already, it is kind of up, but that's the best of the, best of the, that I can come up with. Okay, so that's an idea. Um, uh, Let's look at some of the stuff that doesn't look so great. So we end up with things like this. Um, here's Unicredit. So banks relative to stocks, three-month view. Looks like this. Direction down, intensity strong, position just starting. So I have banks as my number one underperformed group in Europe at the moment. Fresh signal. Um, this is, it's kind of hard to see on this, this chart, chart should be sh more short term, but it's not, sorry. Anyways, they've been underperforming for about five or six weeks. The forecast is down. And so, and I have things like, here's Unicredit relative to the equally weighted bank group uh, turning down, absolute, uh, turning down. It's kind of, um, I'm sorry, this is not a very good, let me get a 
shorter view. You can't see anything on that, even that. I don't know. Anyways, uh, some of these, so uh, the names that I have are Royal Bank of Scotland, Unicredit, Intesa, Lloyd's, um, UBS Barclays, Spanish banks, and a, a couple of Swiss banks. Um, uh, sorry. <laughs> well, what do you know about that? <laughs> uh, industrial goods and services. Valorex, Schneider, BAE Systems, uh, Vestas, which has had a huge run, um, Atlantia, Volvo, Scania, things like that. Um, uh, so those, these are the names that I'm telling people to lighten up on or for hedge funds to short. short these are my short ideas. Construction and materials, Spanish construction companies, luxury companies, um, I think they're vulnerable to the emerging market thing. Um, and I think there are people are over positioned in those and uh, they, it, they've worked but they've, they've kind of underperformed actually for a little while but um, I wouldn't p put them as my number one short idea but I think that they they're um, let's just say they're over owned and that they're vulnerable to the kind of Im economic environment that I see and uh, and then technology there's a lot of technology stocks that don't look so great and then I'd like to spend a minute on the US like I'm in a rock concert. Um, so the U.S. Here's the idea: um, consumer staples. This is weekly consumer staples relative to the S&P. The, the left side of this chart is beginning of 2003. Um, has underperformed in the rally. The defensive stuff underperforms. Um, when the market goes up, usually, which, by the way, e even though I'm I am fighting the tape at the moment on thinking that the stock market's going to go down where they keep going up, what I'm seeing this is what I'm seeing beneath the surface, where the defensive stuff has actually been outperforming for about four or five weeks, here uh, not at a new low, consumer staples. So this is supposed to go up, outperform, and what is supposed to go down is same similar to Europe. Here's industrial. So I have a fresh. This is industrial sector divided by the S&P, so the ratio of the industrials to, to the S&P index should be peaking and should be heading down. Notice it's had a bit of a move. And um, materials, same thing, direction down, intensity strong, position just starting, three-month view. And these have really been bad performer. So uh, um, this has had a bounce and a downtrend as far as I'm concerned, and we're headed lower, so materials companies. Um, so that same kind of idea, cyclical, underperform, tech as another one, tech, uh, and then I'd just like to very quickly cover a couple things and then, and then uh, finish up here. So tech has underperformed by a lot in the U.S. That has a lot to do with Apple, of course. Apple's a big weight in this cap-weighted thing. Um, but I have a lot, a real lot of tech stocks breaking down beneath the surface of this market. Let me give you an example. On my, sh on my sell and short list, I have all these stocks. By the way, Tesla has been my number one short name for about six weeks or so. It's been working like a charm. Uh, but I have NCR. These stocks are breaking down. N not Apple yet. Apple's b b hit a new high this week. Uh, Sienna, I had Cisco on the sell list before that hit announced that order to decline in emerging markets. Ericsson, Alcatel, a lot of semiconductor companies, a applied materials, AMD, um, semiconductor makers, internet companies, a lot of these uh, s Chinese um, internet companies that are listed in the U.S. Also Facebook. Facebook is, is uh, I think, has kind of finished its kind of finished its deal. A lot of cyclical companies, Cummins. Caterpillar, mining, Joy uh, Global is a mining manufacturing equipment. Okay, so that's that's the idea. Sell these, buy those. Um, and uh, one other idea for a buy is this. Here's uh, gold stocks. I know you guys in Switzerland are attuned more to the issue of gold and gold equities than people in some other places. This is the XAU gold stock index monthly going back to 1984, July. So go back. This is as far as data goes back that I have. And here we are 
in the 80s, low 80s, which is where it was in 1984. <laughs> so no progress in the large cap gold stock uh, universe, and it's down approximately 70 percent. Uh, what is uh, the benchmark or the, the relative comparison? Um, uh, yeah, okay. XAU relative to S&P. Looks like that. That's the relative. And I have it almost, it's not quite there. There could be, I'm expecting maybe a little more pain for a few weeks or months of, in gold. But I would be, since I don't come through Switzerland very often, and, and you know, in the terms of things that are, you know, b uh, buy low, bad sentiment, unwanted, um, that I would recommend gold stocks. And when I look at, a, uh, just a quick aside on that, when I look at the individual names, I am getting a buy signal, and they're down a lot more. Like here's one, BVN, Buena Ventura. It's a Peruvian miner. Uh, it's down, like some of these are down 80, 90 percent. And, um, you know, at the bottom, there's usually some volatility goes back and forth. But I would be accumulating, I would look to accumulate gold stocks. And if you think about it, the gold stocks have, have, res have resumed um, negative correlation to the market. So if you're a long only portfolio manager, this is almost like buying puts. This is something you can buy if you're worried about market risk. Um, gold stocks are probably going to go up when the market goes down. And that's what I, that's my forecast. I, not quite yet. I think maybe a little more sloppiness <coughs> for a few weeks or months, but um, w well worth being on your uh, in your radar screen. So that's pretty much the story. Let me just review, let, let me just repeat the conclusions. And, um, oh, oh, dollar, hang on a second. So dollar, dollar up. I have a fresh uh, intermediate term, three month uh, forecast for the dollar. Not, I, I, this one, I don't really have, I, I don't know what this means. I don't have a good explanation for it, how it fits into everything. Could be maybe tapering, who knows. But um, dollar, so dollar, dollar up versus euro. We're right around the 200-week average. Um, by the way, you notice uh, the 200-week average has been worked pretty well in terms of, of inflection points in the currencies. Um, but the currencies have been a hard, rough trade this year. You know, there hasn't been a lot of follow-through. There's been, if you're a currency trader, you maybe the short-term traders have done okay, but it's been it hasn't been easy. There's been a lot of whipsaws in that. Okay, so the idea is. Um, Back to the original thesis, we're 54 months into something that usually lasts 45 months. Um, QE, which I didn't get a, have a lot of time to spend on. I used to work for a government securities dealer, and I've observed the process firsthand of the central bank uh, monetizing debt by buying it from the government securities dealer with new money, which is basically counterfeiting, but they're allowed to do it. Um, so. Uh, the QE, it, it just one quick aside on that. So the Fed's balance sheet is, you know, they're buying 85 billion a, a, a month, and it looks like that. That's weekly Fed balance sheet, total Fed credit. And the Fed is now 69 times leveraged. They have 55 billion in equity, and they pay all their dividends from, running, from this huge pile of treasuries and mortgages that they own. To the, they pay all the dividends to the treasury. So they, their capital stays the same. So every time they do add six, you know, 85 billion, they're expanding leverage. So their leverage has gone up from 50 to 69 times, and they're oblivious. You know, they they couldn't care less. Nobody really. Uh, so, not that they're going to go bankrupt or anything, but uh, it's just that it's ex it's kind of an example of the craziness. So, but my thesis is, yeah, it's worked so far. It's affected people's. Um, the, you know what they have what they call the portfolio balance channel, which is basically they squeezed people by re financial repression by by having zirp that 's z i r p zero interest rate policy and constant q you know q e quantitative easing buying you know monetizing debt they have forced investors into risky securities junk bonds, high yield debt, and equities. And there are actually speeches by Fed officials saying this was their objective a year ago. They call it the portfolio balance channel. We, they, we want to shift, our, we will force investors into doing it. So you're, you're basically being manipulated by the Fed and it, with so far it's worked. However, I think that they do not control the economic cycle and that the, the transmission mechanism is, is through the emerging markets, which is, they have lost control of, you know, it's not working anymore. That feeds back into a decline in earnings and a 
just a typical business cycle, contract, business cycle contraction. Not the end of the world, but earnings go down, stocks go down. Uh, you want to be uh, in outperforming. If you, if you have to have long exposure, be defensive. And there's, uh, there's a huge opportunity, 12-month view in utilities and telecom over here. And in the U.S., also for three-month view, uh, it's the typical stuff, consumer staples, you, you know, personal products, things like that, house, food and beverage. And you might get blown up. Individual names like we saw, uh, the, you know, is it Cointreau? You know, the, there's that, the, these companies are not immune to this process because they're, 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 anybody that has uh, emerging market exposure can get hit, and that could be a food and beverage company too. So I, I think it's, you're better off having actually ETF or sector exposure than individual company exposure that you might, uh, you might have... Get, have more risk from that, and uh, so that's it. Um, not, it. With that rosy little scenario of look out for downside risk and be defensive. That's the, that's the end of my. Uh, what's your take on Japan? I I think I it's the one market that is is uh, I don't have a short position on. I think it could rally, but w you know I'm very. Um, cognizant of the risk over there right now we, we, there might be a military confrontation any day so that's something you know with china they're they're they've got the aircraft carriers and, and they're all lining up the model doesn't know anything about that all that kind of stuff but it is it does seem to be just looking at the model forecast i expect the yen to weaken and so i think the idea of of just monetization and getting away with it i think Without a military confrontation, yes, I think that, that, that that's actually the one place in the world. Oh, there's uh, two other markets that I like, Ukraine and Bangladesh. <laughs> but they look, you know, they're the ones that are way down in the gutter. <laughs> Bad news. I have one for you. Uh, in the uh, 2000, uh, in the big picture chart that you showed, uh, you showed uh, the 2009 development just like a uh, like a regular uh, cyclical crisis or a, a <coughs> business cycle downturn. Um, so, uh, do you treat it? Do you see it as just a cyclical downturn as well, a financial crisis like that, or is there a qualitative difference? Uh, in back then, you mean 2009? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it felt like the end of the world, didn't it? I mean, with Lehman Brothers and everything. Um, but uh, now, my work turned bullish in, in April, and I, I was bullish on financials. If you go back, I have that in the intro report. So, the model actually said buy financials. Remember, buy low with bad sentiment. So, sometimes the worst sentiment it always looks the most bleak. And so, actually, that was an extreme buying opportunity in financials at that point. Um, uh, it's not at the moment. So. Um, Y you know, I mean, y I've studied, uh, f you know, financial crises and business and cycle depressions, you know, and it, they're not the end of the world. You know, if somebody goes bankrupt, it, it's not like the system ends or something, you know. We don't, we're not going back to living in caves and bartering, you know. things. That I think the market forces can sort things out. I'm not a big fan of government intervention, you know, maybe that it had to happen then or something. I, it, it, you know, if it was up to me, I would have let you know, the market sort things out, you know, itself. Uh, but um, anyways, no, I don't think that that was just kind of an extreme example of a, of a buying opportunity, really, in financials. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Yes. Do you have any personal opinion or uh, model based on, on gold? Or? Yeah, same thing as like I showed you XAU. Uh, okay, so same thing that yeah, gold stocks. Right. Clear. Yeah. Some it's kind of a bottom. Right. Some kind of bottom for me. I'm nervous. The next maybe the next few weeks or months there might be some more sloppiness I'm not, it's not I got quite off to the races confirmed yet but it's out there and um, I'm actually speaking at a conference next week in London about gold mining stocks the kind of stuff, like opportunities that exist in the gold mining stocks which are sort of like the banks were in 2009 basically that's the that's if there's anything like that now that's really what else is down a lot you know the utilities and telecom and and gold stocks basically haven't haven't gone up. There's not a lot of other things that, that aren't already, you know, haven't already been inflated. Okay. If there's no more questions, I'm sure that you can ask Michael about uh, the more technical details of this model uh, in the lunch. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, well, let's give him a hand. All right. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.